All right. First of all, thank you to uh, all of you for organizing uh, this series. It's been, I think it's part of what got us through those awful early days in uh, the pandemic where we could still, you know, still sort of converse and stuff, uh, despite being locked up at home. Um, so thank you. And so it's a real pleasure to present here because I've, you know, admired this series for a long time. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is um, about um, some work that we've been doing in our group uh, that has to be really do about uh, how different scales of uh, living systems sort of work together or uh, or not uh, in terms of actually regulating physiological outputs, things like growth and stuff of the cell. So let me go ahead and launch right into it. Let's see. Yeah. So I always like to start with this kind of uh, uh, quote from Francois Jacob, uh, which is uh, inspirational to me in terms of you know, how I think about the cell, which is the dream of every cell is to become two cells, right? Uh, and if you think about uh, how that uh, dream happens, really molecularly, uh, really what cells are doing in order to fulfill this dream is to is to take simple inputs like this, uh, you know, these sugar cubes, for example, on the left. And they t uh, process those inputs in a wide variety of ways and make more copies of themselves, right? So that's the, a little micrograph of uh, budding yeast cells on the right, that, uh, which is the organism of choice in our group. Um, but of course, uh, we all know that this, to actually implement this dream, um, it's a very complicated process, right? In between this simple looking input of sugar and simple looking output, which is these little balloons that you know, are, are the cells. Of course, there's this gigantic mess of reactions that have to actually carry out this transformation of, of, of matter. And um, as you, especially for those of us who sort of think about uh, st things like statistical physics, you can imagine that, um, you know, th these are small systems, right? And uh, they're often dealing with small mo numbers of molecules uh, in these complicated reaction networks. And so every single step uh, on this process from simple input to um, biological output is buffeted by all kinds of fluctuations and noise and, uh, you know, a, a mess of things that would seem to destroy any hopes of getting uh, order out of this system. Um, and so a major question that we have in our minds is basically, you know, how much variability uh, can these biological systems tolerate at various scales of organization and still function, still perform? Um, that's a big question. And you can ask that question from everything from sort of a molecular scale um, uh, questions all the way up to organs. Um, my student, Xi Xing Wang, uh, even has a little dot, dot, dot in this diagram. Maybe you can think of societies and economies. All, you know, so these kinds of fluctuations, they pervade uh, every scale of, of, of living systems. Um, in our group, though, we really focus in on this cellular scale. Uh, and in particular, we're really interested in um, this question of uh, how uh, cellular scale processes uh, are tolerant or not tolerant of um, fluctuations at things like organelle or molecular scale processes. Um, and that's where we're really going to focus on today. So um, we're actually going to, uh, in, in trying to understand basically how at this scale of biological organization, how fluctuations um, impact uh, or are regulated by uh, by cells um, we the the reason we go about this is we believe that we can actually learn a lot about the function of living systems by studying these fluctuations um, so we in our group go about this in two different ways so we actually look at individual structures in the cell um, and try to understand things like how precisely does the cell actually maintain uh, the properties of those structures, things like how, you know, how precisely does the cell count its mitochondria or how carefully does it uh, regulate the size of its peroxisomes. And, you know, we sort of look at individual organelles at a time and just try to ba understand basically how precisely cells maintain those kinds of properties. And what can we learn about how cells actually make these structures based on fluctuations in those properties? Um, that's gonna that's that's largely work I'm uh, not going to be able to talk about too much today, um, because the other thing we really are interested in is trying to understand. You know, we know that the cell, it isn't just um, made up of sort of isolated components that just don't talk to each other, right? All these different organelles in the cell, the molecules that they make um, and consume, uh, they're all interacting with each other. 
And so uh, the, what I'm going to focus on today really has to do with trying to understand how correlations in this uh, network of organelles really uh, sort of arise from, um, or how we can capture these correlations uh, at a systems level in, uh, at, for the cell. All right. So just a little highlight of so, sort of work we have done of, at the single organelle level. So. Uh, We've been working a lot to sort of build mathematical models uh, using and testing these models using quantitative data. I don't want you to take anything away from this slide except that we have these models where uh, we can actually try and understand something about uh, copy number control or size control of these structures. Um, these models actually do a reasonably good job of um, predicting uh, key uh, features of uh, actual experimental data. So uh, we can pretty accurately um, you know, predict things like the copy number distribution of a lot of organelles inside cells. We can um, predict all kinds of features of that, that unify the description of different organelles uh, in terms of their size regulation. Um, but yeah, like I said, really the goal today is to talk to you about um, something more at the system scale. So how do these different organelles actually coordinate and correlate their biogenesis um, systems to allow the cell to do things like respond to, to new nutrient environments or to, um, to diverse environmental conditions. Um, so I, I bet you could figure out quite easily how we look at single organelles at a time. In the two slides I just flashed uh, in front of you before, you, we often will do things like label uh, organelles using fluorescent proteins and image those um, structures that way. Uh, but uh, it's you're, you know, you'd be, it'd be a fair question to ask, okay, well, how are you going to do that same kind of imaging or measurement strategy at this system scale where we want to look at multiple organelles in the same cell? And the, uh, what really inspired us uh, was right before uh, we started the group here at WashU, um, uh, uh, the group of Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz and Eric Betzig uh, showed us all that we don't have to settle for just looking at single or even pairs of organelles at a time we have the techniques uh, available to us to actually try and be more systematic about how to characterize the cell at this scale. And so uh, inspired by that work from, from their groups, we created, uh, we, we decided to uh, pursue this strategy where we actually label multiple organelles, in our case, six organelles inside the same cell using a palette of fluorescent proteins, which we can then um, unmix spectrally using a diffraction grading and uh, using sort of fairly simple techniques from uh, laser scanning confocal microscopy, uh, we can then pixel by pixel identify each of the different colors that we're using to label our organelles. And when you do this, you get images like this. So this is what we in the lab jokingly call rainbow yeast. So uh, this is a strain of budding yeast where we have labeled um, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, peroxisomes, lipid droplets, the vacuole, which doubles as a lysosome, and the Golgi apparatus, uh, all in the same cell. And, um, and uh, now we can actually understand uh, things about not just how uh, individual organelles sizes and numbers are, uh, or volumes uh, as a fraction of the cell are regulated, but we can also start to understand how these organelles uh, correlate and interact with each other uh, in order to support physiological function. So just to give you an idea of what the data, raw data actually looks like after we've unmixed, um, you can see that we uh, have a really nice handle on being able to really identify uh, all these structures um, from each other. Uh, and for those of you who are, if there are any organelle aficionados in the audience, uh, some of these structures will look very familiar to you. So for example, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum in yeast has this sort of dual ring structure. There's a, a part of the ER that's around the nucleus, and there's a part that surrounds the whole cell cortex. Uh, mitochondria have these sort of tubules uh, that uh, exist throughout the cell. And so I can sort of walk through all of these, but suffice it to say, um, this uh, hyperspectral imaging method uh, really opens a new door to us in terms of how to uh, understand uh, these processes of systems level organelle biogenesis. Okay, so what can we do with this data? Now that we have images of single cells with all these different organelle properties uh, in the same cell, now we can look at uh, this whole suite of uh, sort of uh, high dimensional uh, 
uh, we have a really high dimensional view of uh, organelle uh, morphologies and um, physical properties all in the same cell. This, for example, here is just a just a three dimensional slice of what really is something more like a 24 to 27 dimensional data set. Here we've just shown a couple uh, cells. Each data point here is a cell, and we're just uh, for this uh, selected set of data, you can see that if we for that same one cell, we can get how many mitochondria there are, how many lipid droplets there are, what's the size of the ER in that cell, so on and so forth. And we can take all this data and we can summarize it in um, in in uh, various statistical ways to let us answer a really uh, to us very fundamental question in cellular biophysics, which is we know that the cell plays uh, the, that the organelles play a very important role in terms of allowing the cell to metabolize and grow uh, but we also know that um that of course the organelles are contained within the cell and they're, they're part of it so somehow this organelle scale and the cell scale have to coordinate their activities uh, both in terms of growth rate and size and we can start to address this question by uh of how does the cell actually do this coordination process how precisely and so on and so forth, um, by actually looking at this data in a very data-driven way. So the first thing we did just as a sort of sanity check was we just selected a whole bunch of features that uh, we thought were important uh, in order to characterize systems of organelle biogenesis. And we just looked at the correlation structure of these features uh, with each other. So for example, uh, here's a correlation map of of a whole variety of organelle features that we can extract from the data. Things like uh, how big are the peroxisomes, how many are there, uh, how many Golgi are there, how many lipid droplets, mitochondria. Uh, we can ask, for those same cells, we can also extract cellular features, things like how big is that cell that, uh, that we're looking at the organelles in. And then we can just see how do these different features correlate with each other. Um, one really important reason why we went about this first is because um, there is quite a lot known. A lot of this field in, uh, of organelle biogenesis actually uh, has worked very hard to understand how the host cell and its organelles relate to each other. Uh, decades of work have shown all kinds of scaling relations between the host cell and its organelles. And the first thing we wanted to check is to make sure that the data that we collected was uh, backed up by all that work. And uh, in, the, the, so in the correlation uh, pixels that I'm sh uh, highlighting in red circles here, those are uh, the, the pixels in this correlation map that have to do with the volume of the cell and the volume of the organelles uh, in that cell. And what you see here are warm colors. And what warm colors indicate is that there is a strong correlation between the size of the cell and the size of its uh, various organelles, which is something that we uh, expected from the literature. Okay, so we think we have a pretty decent handle on the data in this case. Uh, the, the, data, the, the imaging method we're using seems to reproduce um, sort of known features of uh, what, uh, what has been seen in the past. So now we started to explore this data set further to see if there aren't uh, new things that we could um, find out from uh, this systems level view of organelle uh, biogenesis. So one uh, kind of cool uh, thing that we could do with our data was we could um, we could uh, estimate not just the size of the cell as a whole, but we can actually subtract out from that whole cell size things like the um, uh, the volumes of the various organelles and actually estimate something about the size of the cytoplasm itself, right? And um, and we. Uh, the reason we went, uh, the reason we found this interesting is because there's a lot of work on what are called growth laws in terms of uh, trying to relate, you know, what are the processes that actually regulate the size of the cell. And um, these growth laws all make sort of different predictions for this scaling uh, relationship between the volume of the cell and just the cytoplasm. So this is the cell minus all its organelles. And what we saw was this very interesting uh, feature in the scaling exponent that related the volume of the cell to the volume of the cytoplasm. So we went in to this experiment uh, expecting uh, that the, the size of the cell and the size of the cytoplasm ought to just basically be in one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, in the literature, we often make this um, assumption, actually. But when we actually looked at the data, uh, and that's what's shown in this black dashed line in this plot. This is, so there's a lot, double log plot of the cellular volume and the cytoplasmic volume estimate that we have. 
uh, for uh, in lots of individuals, individual cells. And what we, when we actually measured this um, scaling exponent, we got this uh, red dashed line, which is in strong contrast to um, the black dashed line. The red dashed line uh, looks more like a scaling exponent of uh, rather than one, it looks like two thirds. And so whenever I think of a volume being raised to the two thirds power, you think of like an area, a surface area. Um, what the surface area of the cytoplasm means, I cannot tell you. That's something that's some, that we're still thinking about. But uh, one important consequence of a sublinear scaling exponent like this, where it scales with a two thirds power, is this has an implication for um, resource allocation in the cell. One really important feature of cellular growth that's observed from bacteria to even mammalian cells um, is that the size of the cell, so what's represented here in the y-axis, and the growth rate of the cell seem to be highly correlated to each other. So it's uh, this to me was a, a, a surprise. I learned this late in life, actually. But uh, it's been observed many times that um, that faster cell, faster growing cells are bigger. So if you take this, um, if if you take that fact and you take this scaling exponent seriously, what this predicts is that as cells grow bigger, meaning they go up in the y-axis, they have to grow their cytoplasm disproportionately large in order to maintain in order to maintain this uh, high growth rate. Because remember, the cytoplasm is only scaling with two thirds the uh, power. So if I'm going to double the cell's volume, I have to triple, for example, the cytoplasmic volume. So if I plot then the growth rate as a, uh, or if I plot the fraction of the cell taken up by cytoplasm as a function of the growth rate of the cell, I ought to see a positive correlation, which is what we see. That's shown in these green data points here. This, of course, raises kind of an interesting conundrum now for the cell, if you think about it from the cell's perspective. So if I need to grow the cell faster, uh, and if that, as a consequence of that, I need to devote more and more of myself to cytoplasm, who takes the hit, right? The other organelles in the cell uh, have to somehow compensate for this super scaling uh, behavior of the cytoplasm. And that's uh, where we could really leverage the power of our data set to really understand how the cell is uh, sort of allocating this scarce resource among the organelles and either uh, sharing that sacrifice among all its organelles or maybe prioritizing certain organelles over others in order to uh, achieve this uh, growth. So I'm going to skip this and say, OK, so the way um, the way we tried to identify whether organelles are um, all sharing the sacrifice or whether there are sort of specific sets of organelles that are prioritized over others is we took this very data driven approach, which was nicely illustrated just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful way to go about um, this kind of um, inference. And it's, in our uh, data driven approach, what we do is we take all of our data. So this is now lots of single cells, lots of different uh, measurements of the different organelles. And we really focus on this volume fraction part of the data. So we're looking at um, basically uh, how each cell varies the volume fractions of all its various organelles under different conditions. Okay, we take this data and we simply apply a simple principal components analysis to it to try and understand just from the data uh, where the variation is coming in in terms of uh, when the cells are growing at different concentrations of uh, nutrient, for example. So uh, what's shown here is uh, an example of our principal components analysis of this uh, uh, of our rainbow yeast cells. And it's shown for two concentrations of glucose. In orange, you see uh, cells. So each, again, data point is a cell. Uh, you see cells that are grown in no glucose. And in blue, you see cells that are grown in 2% glucose. And what you'll, I hope you'll notice is that you see this in this principal component representation, uh, you see that the, this, there's a separation between the orange cloud and the blue cloud, indicating that uh, in this volume fraction space, there is movement along some directions, which are revealed by the principal components. And now our question is, okay, uh, what, uh, which of these principal components does the, do the cells mostly move on when they, have to, um, when they are in different nutrient environments? And what are those principal components in terms of the actual biology of the system? 
So in order to define this um, movement, we, um, we actually define what we call a condition vector. So this is just a vector that connects the centroids of the two clouds of, uh, of cells in this principal component space. Okay, so that tells us how the clouds move. And what we uh, first want to see is, okay, in that condition, if, if you look at that condition vector, how collinear is that condition vector with all the various principal components in the system? And what we notice is that there's a variety, there is sort of a hierarchy of, uh, you know, there are preferred directions, basically, of that condition vector in this principal component space. And what are these principal components biologically? So the top three, uh, um, the top three directions that the clouds move in most significantly uh, are made up of basically two different types of principal, principal components. So PC1 and PC0 are ones where you have this shared sacrifice set of modes. So everyone seems to sacrifice uh, in terms of um, its volume fractions to allow, presumably to allow space for um, the cytoplasm to grow. There is a very significant uh, a PC2 component to this movement, however, and that's this, it's a very interesting mode where it seems that the Golgi that's labeled by G and peroxisomes labeled in P in this heat map, they seem to go up in volume fraction and everything else either stays steady or goes down. So there's this kind of bifurcated uh, set of uh, priorities where it seems like Golgi and peroxisomes are prioritized over the others. And then we can also map the other ones, they're less significant. So what we really wanted to do uh, uh, in terms of, um, so, so this tells us something like there's some sort of balance between this shared sacrifice set of modes and something about priorities. Um, glucose, however, so is a complicated input for the cells because it's a natural, it's, you know, it's something they see naturally. And again, it's one of these um, stresses it's one of these uh, variations in environment that result in cells coupling their growth rate to their cell size. So one uh, hypothesis that we had in order to, that we wanted to test uh, after we saw this principal component data was, you know, is it the case that the, those two driving variables, growth rate and cell size, do those have to do basically with this, uh, these different principal components popping up in uh, our data analysis of, uh, of these yeast cells? And so um, what we did is we actually uh, performed a bunch of sort of chemical biology tricks to try and understand separately how cell size and growth rate individually impact um, or separately impact uh, the systems level organelle biogenesis. So in order to, to do this, in order to separately try and tune cell size and growth rate, we uh, we appealed to uh, a, a really beautiful set of tricks uh, that we dug up from uh, ver various other groups. So, for example, um, you can change the cell size uh, of uh, um, of budding yeast by overexpressing this gene called We5. This is a, a really beautiful result from Jan Scottheim's group a couple years ago, where they showed that you can definitely tune the size. The mechanism by which this happens, people still kind of worry about, but uh, but this this uh, works very well in our hands. We see definitely two and a half fold changes in um, our cell sizes. And the way this works is we overexpress it using this um, hormone called beta estradiol. Um, that result, and when you add saturated amounts of beta estradiol, you get this sort of twofold increase in cell size. So when we increase the cell size twofold, what happens to the organelle modes? Which uh, are they at all related to ones that we saw in glucose? So we do the same kind of analysis. We do PCA on now cell size varied cells and do uh, all of this uh, on our rainbow yeast. And again, we see this sort of hierarchy of principal components that pop out uh, that are more or less collinear with uh, the cell size condition vector. And if you look carefully, you'll see that PC1 and PC0, they look a lot like the shared sacrifice modes that we saw in the glucose data. So it's ones where everyone seems to go down and these sort of dominate the cell size response uh, in terms of the organelle modes excited by variations in cell size. We did a similar trick now looking at growth rate by exploiting the fact that we actually built rainbow yeast to be oxytrophic to a, a nutrient, the amino acid leucine. So because these, are, um, these cells can't make their own leucine, we can actually tune the growth rate of the cells 
by supplying varying amounts of leucine. And now we can run the same trick. So now we al allow the cells to grow at different rates. We, uh, we do the same principal components analysis. And again, we see a split between cells that have a lot of leucine or have no leucine. We construct a condition vector from these. We see again a hierarchy of directions in this principal component space. And again, we see now in, in, in this leucine case, we see um, the other mode popping up, this sort of prioritized mode where Golgi and Proxosome seem to be slightly prioritized and the other ones seem to take the hit. So it seems like growth rate and leucine, a uh, growth rate and cell size excite individually those modes that we saw from glucose. Finally, we wanted to see whether this, um, this set of organelle modes that are excited by nutrient stresses, whether those are just due to actual physical limitations because of the uh, actual nutrients uh, we're supplying or the size of the cell we're tuning to, or whether these are just regulated by the signaling pathways that normally will um, mediate that information. And so we explore the fact that we uh, could individually uh, control uh, what are called the protein kinase A and wrap and target of rapamycin pathways in these yeast cells. So these are it's a pretty engineered cell strain, you can imagine. And what we see is, again, we, uh, we grow cells with uh, varying amounts of PKA activity or TOR activity. We see the separation uh, in the clouds in the PC space. And this uh, little heat map sort of really summarizes the, the results so, that we see at the end of our study. So we see that um, the uh, the pathways themselves seem to be able to pro invoke the same organelle modes that the nutrient stresses did. And in particular, we see this orthogonality between the TOR and protein kinase A pathways, which are the main pathways that respond to glucose. We see that the PKA pathway seems to really uh, communicate information about the cell size to the organelle biogenesis program, whereas the TOR pathway seems to uh, sort of individually communicate something about the growth rate separately from cell size to the systems of the organelle biogenesis program. So um, I hope I've convinced you that um, these organelle, uh, at, the, at the systems level, it seems like organelles aren't completely independent of each other. They actually cluster into these correlated modes that are excited by various uh, perturbations. Um, that, and that growth rate and size actually aren't communicating the same information to the systems of the organelle biogenesis. They're actually distinct signals that regulate them separately. And, but of course, there's lots more to do. So we want to look at biogenesis mutants. We want to look at how the organelle interaction structure mediates all this uh, sculpting of the cell. We want to do this in uh, dynamics, so to actually take time-lapse data. And I want to stop by thanking all the people in the lab who did all this work, especially uh, uh, Xi Xing Wang, whose work I highlighted today. Uh, thank funding sources, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Shankar, for a wonderful talk. And so uh, I'll ask you two questions from the chat, and then we will go to the informal question Q&A for both you and Yunan. So Brian Munsky asks, uh, are these organelle measurements and correlation plots only for fixed cell measurements, or can you also track slash quantify in time, in time-lapse microscopy, for example, to get temporal cross-correlations of, of X of T and Y of T plus tau? So the data I showed today is all for fixed times. Uh, our immediate, like, you know, right now, people in the lab downstairs from me are actually working on developing methods to make this uh, happen at higher time resolution. We can take time, we can take time uh, lapse data at a pretty low time resolution uh, right now. The issue is that this is all scanning confocal microscopy, which is very photo damaging. But we are working hard on some tricks to try and uh, get around that time resolution issue. Yeah. Thank you. And then quick second question from Ashok Prasad. Uh, just to clarify, cytosol volume is what is left after you have removed all the other organelles in the cytoplasm. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, Shankar. Thank you both Shankar and Yunan, you know, again, for the wonderful talks. I'm clapping on everybody's behalf. So now we will move on to the 15 minute informal Q&A part. So I'm going to stop recording.